FinTech Association was having its annual general meeting, I was re-elected to the board, so literally just then. <laughs> um, so so um, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, when I first heard about this organization, I thought it was, it was a fantastic opportunity, especially with the area of legal uh, innovation and the like, really growing from what I consider that North America is really advanced, and then there's Europe, and then there's Asia. And so really we can learn so much more from from others. Um, it's a particular joy because when I was uh, researching the creation of Light Lab, um, I reached out to Kat, right? Um, and I met Andy when he visited Hong Kong. And in fact, I was so pleased when I met with uh, Dan, Dan Jackson and Dan Rodriguez uh, because I, when I set up Light Lab, I added the word lab at the end. My, and my law school dean said, lab? Why is there a lab at law school? Right, so Light Lab stands for Law, Innovation, Technology, and Entrepreneurship. A uh, brief introduction of, whoops, maybe that's not what I want. Uh, I got to the. Oh. Oh. Thanks so much. Oh, no, it's the wrong one. That's okay, I'll just click. It should work. Right here. Uh, oh, that's right. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. So it's uh, Light Lab stands for Law, Innovation, Technology, and Entrepreneurship. It's an interdisciplinary experiential program at the Faculty of Law. So by way of brief uh, uh, description, and, and if you have further questions, happy to go into it. Um, we're, we're undergraduates, so those in, in the UK and, and, and um, in this neck of the woods will understand. In the US, tends to be a postgraduate course. Uh, we're very lucky. It's interdisciplinary. So Hong Kong U's got 10 faculties. Um, I've got students from seven of the ten faculties, so we're really able to, to create interdisciplinary um, uh, um, experiences. The, it's experiential, so it's not a clinic. I specifically don't call it a clinic because I'm admitted in three jurisdictions, but I don't have a practicing certificate, so no legal advice, right? So, so um, but again, um, what we do then is we actually have. Uh, opportunities to work with what I call a different segment of underrepresented organizations, which is legal tech startups. So while we do cover the, the, the law of tech, right, uh, which is you know, AI, blockchain, cloud, and data, ABCD, working with, on real life projects with project partners, we also cover the tech of law. And that's where we've done some um, um, uh, access to justice kind of projects where our students were lucky enough to have won the Georgetown High Tech Law uh, invitational, but we've also uh, worked on um, projects with corporate counsel on on proof of concepts, and we were lucky enough to have won uh, an award with Clock last year. So this time last year I was in uh, Vegas. For those that uh, know about uh, that particular space, which is fascinating. So today I want to talk about uh, generative AI. You know, the the topic of, of the moment of sorts. Um, so this is the Goldman, the, the famous Goldman Sachs um, uh, chart which talks about how 44% uh, you know, uh, of legal tasks, again, newspapers misquote that, but it's legal tasks, uh, judged by Goldman as, as being, uh, and this is especially for the US and Europe, uh, that, will be, uh, that will be used generative AI. Interestingly, uh, for my Hong Kong audiences, I also add this one. Hong Kong is looking at, <laughs> going to be one of the most automated uh, because we have a very strong services industry. Um, so so this, this kind of gets the policymakers in my neck of the woods um, focused on this. So, so as you all would know, Gen AI with, um, started in November 30th, and, and last semester, and Hong Kong U famously actually banned ChatGPT. Now, for those that don't, you, uh, that, that don't know, and a lot of people forget this, um, Hong Kong is deemed to be part of China, and therefore it's geo-locked. OpenAI does not allow Hong Kong people to get access to OpenAI, uh, to ChatGPT. But a lot of people have VPNs, so they can do it, but not everybody does. So the university took the role that, you know, if you all, the CS stu students, have, have the VPNs, but others don't, then you get the, 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 the assessments come through, how do we deal with that? So they, they started by the, with the ban. But uh, I think they found that they were overly cautious there, and in fact, now they've gone the other direction, which, and, and so let me start with that aspect first. So they had the ban on the Friday. On Monday, I wrote to the administrators, copied my dean and head of the department, said, um, I need Light Lab, Law, Innovation, Technology, Entrepreneurship. I have to use this. 
Um, and they were very quick to come back to say, you know, we leave it to the instructors because ultimately it's, it's an assessment issue. So, so with this semester, I almost felt it was my obligation. So in my two classes, um, I actually introduced um, Gen AI as part of the course uh, requirement. So one class um, uh, is, is called Light Lab uh, Tech Startup Law, where they actually work with project partners uh, from the innovation technology ecosystem. So often they are um, startups, they're also professional services firms, but I've even had law departments kind of reach out to us and, and work on projects. And the second one, the Light Lab Law Tech and Reg Tech Sandbox, that's where they work with in-house counsel on no code, no code platforms to create um, um, proof of concepts, and in fact this semester we're working on what we call um, the cookbook where we're going to create open source tools on Microsoft Power so that anybody can actually book, um, try, uh, um, in-house NGOs but also law schools, if you want to teach legal tech, you can get access to these open source tools. So that, that's the project that we have there. Um, so these are the big thematic things for the legal profession. As you've heard, I, I spent a long time in private practice and in-house. Um, you know, when ANO and PwC said, guess what, every single lawyer is going to get access to this, suddenly, if you aspire to that, you're like, okay, this is not a fringe thing, you know, main, this is coming into the mainstream law. Um, uh, importantly, uh, everybody's got Microsoft, and Microsoft is now going to introduce Copilot, uh, which is going to allow you to create uh, PowerPoint presentations uh, using all your data, to create uh, papers using all your own data and like. So, um, watch for this space. And again, Microsoft is something most lawyers know. Word is, if any document they know, not, not, uh, not Excel. They don't know Excel, but they know, they, they know Word. Right? Um, now, so, so when we, when we talk, come to the issue of uh, prompt engineering, the first issue is access, right? Uh, and, I've, uh, I, I, and so um, one of the things when introducing into the class is to make sure that everybody does have access. So you've got some that are, um, a lot of students do have uh, VPNs, but some don't. So, but in fact, it's my students that tell me about these alternative platforms like Po and the like that allow you to access some of these tools, but without going through the, the, the main uh, elements. So, so what they were tasked with really developing legal, oops, um, you know, so I, I like to give agency in my class so the students get to choose what they want to actually work on. So what legal test case do you want to use? Um, how, I need to make sure they have get access to um, Gen AI, so they have a choice of the different ones. Uh, some even chose Notion. Um, you get to compare the different Gen AIs, because sometimes, as you may know, you, you ask the same question to the different Gen AIs, you may get different answers, right? Um, how do you develop and share the legal prompts? That's what, you know, um, Daz uh, from MIT with now calls legal prompt engineering. Um, and then how do you have reflection in relation to your, to your learnings? So the, the pictures down below are some of my, my research and thinking. Um, I was doing research in uh, AI um, governance uh, and recently had a book published on AI in finance. So there I talked about Chiron uh, for the um, fan of Greek mythology. Chiron is the wisest and justice of centaurs. And it was when Kasparov lost the big blue, he talked about centaur chess. So how can we actually use that, that optimal um, combination? But with, with ChatGPT, it became almost like, like, like the genie, right? So you're now asking for wishes, and what wishes come out to you, right? And how do you, do you ask the right questions and the, the eternal fables about what, what you wish for? Um, but then I started thinking, is it going towards the guru? where people are now asking it, and there's some interesting uh, things where people are saying, okay, how do I make $100,000? And then they follow the instructions of the ChatGPT to, to, to do that. So, so how, how are we using these tools um, in, in the different ways? Um, so here's a quick snapshot of what my students actually did. Um, so I asked them to choose the category of lawyer they wanted to choose. Um, contract review, contract drafting, court pleadings, legal research, correspondence due diligence, uh, uh, legal workflow and patents. So those are the ones that they had actually chosen. So for example, I, I've anonymized the student names, but you know, they, whether it's to review certain kind of documents. So, so uh, one of the things I had mentioned was, uh, so the two basic rules are number one, uh, everything that uh, you have got to check everything, right? We all know about hallucinations. Um, secondly, um, you know, don't put confidential information in. We, we know about the Samsung situation. So, so especially when in ingesting certain kind of documentation, we have to, we need to get it from public sources. So that's where Edgar and like is, is important. So they, some of them looked at loan documents uh, or con uh, employment contracts, 
um, uh, on the contract drafting, some of the sort towards generating kind of contracts and like as well. Um, one student even looked towards pleadings, basic kind of pleadings, um, and then coming out. Uh, there are of course legal research and correspondence letters to the demand, which is actually something it does pretty well uh, because uh, of uh, the nomenclature. And then uh, we also had set of students that actually started using um, uh, ChatGPT to create workflow um, uh, uh, and, and the like. And so, so what I asked them to think about is, you know, uh, what, who is the user of this? What is your persona? Uh, what use case do you have? So this is the great thing, it doesn't matter what area of the law you have, what point of view you, you'd you like to have, what form. Uh, and then uh, I asked them to also uh, draft, you know, uh, what are the risks, what, what weird stuff did you encounter? And last but not least, what are your reflections? Um, and then from there, uh, I, uh, I also, I, I described this as using students as, as learning partners. So because, as, as we all know, none of us actually had expertise in this. We all learned, you know, as, as the students learned. Um, and so then we created a shared drive where they got to share their tricks and tricks, uh, their tips and tricks, including you know what magic words do you use, um, and then what chains of thought prompting did you actually create? And so then we have a uh, we created a, a tool that uh, we could all learn from uh, and the like as well. Um, so this is actually uh, at the reflection stage. I actually asked the students to do reflections, and this became quite interesting. Um, a lot of them started off being more fearful of it, but the final outcome was really they were more, um, so the vast majority of them were excited by what they feel can, uh, uh, this can make them more efficient and in terms of their future. But the second most um, um, reflected upon aspect was it could create new opportunities for different career paths. Right? So, so I thought that was, this was quite interesting. Now, now from my own point of view, um, general findings included you know, limitations in legal um, research because, as we know, the corpus of training for a lot of those models were not using um, legal databases, but now LexisNexis and Thomson Reuters have announced their own uh, LLM, so we'll see what happens. Uh, having human working in the loop, which is a phrase I use for my um, uh, AI governance, I think remains important. Um, query, especially you need to check, but query whether or not you know, the confidential data information is solved because of the cloud, uh, if you have a private cloud, and then of course the hands-on experience that the students had with this actually negates a lot of initial uh, impressions or anxieties and provides them all with confidence in terms of skill development. So again, uh, testament to the, those of us that are in clinics and we believe in, in learning by doing. Now I, for my sins, I then got recruited by the university to be part of the Generative AI Task Force, mm -hmm. so this applying to the whole university. And so these are some of the topics that we had in the third forum that they asked me to moderate. And so you'll find that these are reflections from different uh, faculties as well. Um, the, the final faculty was in, what, in terms of what they call ethical dilemmas. The university view ended up being as follows. You know, we want students to be gen AI and AI literate, so the university, would, after banning it, they now <laughs> have a different, right? So it's now, they've got, now come up strong. But they say, Hong Kong U, the structures of students want to ensure that students are assessed in their own work and not fake and they want to deliver this by next semester. So they wanted to do this, that's why we're, they're working on the policy as we speak, so that professors and instructors can get all of their, their assessments uh, ready by then. And so we had different sharings from different uh, folk, from different uh, um, uh, faculties. And, and my, my own take there is, it actually comes down to pedagogy assessment and learning outcomes. So linked to Kat's question, what is it that we want to teach at law school? And we have this, philosophical debate. Law school is, is a more of a professional learning. It's interesting for those of us who teach in undergraduate versus postgraduate, because by the time they go postgrad, they should know that that's what they want to do, um, and it costs a lot to do that, right? Whereas undergrads, my oldest son is 17, he's now exploring the world, he doesn't know what he did. I didn't know what I wanted to do at that age, but this is the age that a lot of us are studying this. So, so I think it does come down to um, thinking about the learning outcomes, thinking about how we're actually uh, approaching in terms of what we're learning and how they are learning and then uh, uh, drastic assessment. So in our light lab, we actually throw a lot of different fun things, right? So the final deliverable for the main class that I have is actually digital, digital artifact. And some of these are, some people use the word AI proof. So what courses are you going to have that are going to be AI proof? Because that's what the going in assumption is. Right now, the technology is not able to detect it. So it's digital asset uh, artifacts, group work, 
uh, that's why I like Andy's kind of uh, assessment kind of aspects. Um, uh, individual uh, learning reflections, end of semester presentations. Uh, we actually focus on the product of what they actually deliver that we mark. Are we fo getting them to focus on the process of what they're doing? Um, and then now, uh, and then uh, with the experiential learning, they actually learn and they, they get project partner feedback and they also have uh, peer assessments as well. So with that, that's a little bit of a sharing in relation to what we were doing in the last semester. I hope to learn from all of you as we all stumbling along together. Thank you. Yeah.